<laughs> Bob. Uh, but I did want to just quickly give you the agenda that I sent to both uh, Jean Ann and Sarah, just kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be covering tonight. So they are going to be talking about uh, body safety, stewards for children, and the Safer Smarter Teens program. And all three of these programs we do sponsor from the Doolin Exchange Club. So because of that sponsorship, it allows them to get into the Doolin schools with these great programs. We are going to talk to them about how they are delivering these programs in the world of COVID. Um, and then if they, if, if they do have results, we're kind of looking at some of the results that we've seen in terms of how we, these programs are actually impacting um, what we're trying to uh, accomplish. Um, I did ask them if they could talk to us about um, any program. So the program, the body safety is really about sexual abuse and really helping people understand what's proper touch and not proper touch. But um, we're not really doing a lot on the physical and emotional abuse, um, which are other serious issues. Um, and so I did ask them to talk about are there programs for those areas that we should be considering? Um, I do know that Jean Ann said there are some new programs that they're doing at Dunebrook that they want to talk to us about as well. And then uh, my final question that I posed to them is, when they look at the, the entire system of child protective services in the state of Indiana, is there anything that could be done better in terms of protecting kids? And certainly, you know, um, we don't want to put you guys on the spot, but I do think that certainly one of the things that we don't talk about is, you know, is there anything legislatively or things that we should be doing more proactively on a state level uh, that maybe need to be changed within the system? This is being recorded. So, you know, <laughs> feel free to say what you want to say, but um, I think it's, I think it's good for us to be aware in terms of how that process works and plays out. I know it's very complicated. And then um, we're hoping we're going to have enough time to have Q and A. Um, I think um, because we are a smaller group, um, when we get done with the presentation, then we will have you unmute if you do have a question and, um, and then we'll just be more, uh, a little bit more informal on that level. So with that, um, I am going to ask uh, Jackie to go ahead and do the introductions because Jackie, you are the one I think that's been working with Dunebrook um, since we started our partnership with them. So I, I know you know Jeanne and Sarah really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. <laughs> it's hard to look at yourself and present, but um, I will try to not distract myself. Um, I have known Jean Ann and Sarah for many years because of the body safety program that we um, support financially in the Doonland schools. Um, so, and I know that many of you are familiar with them because they've um, sp spoken to us before and have been in the club long time, but I'm really honored that they're taking time tonight to speak to us and to a broader group. Um, Doonbrook Child Advocacy Center is in Michigan City, but it serves many um, counties and they'll go into that um, more in detail. But Jean Ann Cannon is the executive director. Um, and I'm guessing, but probably about five years now. And um, Sarah Hoyt is the public education coordinator. The mission at Doonbrook is to help parents build healthier, happy families. And they support programs like the Body Safety. Um, they are a child forensic interview location for our counties. And um, more recently, they're um, participating with the Doolin Exchange Club in the Stewards of Children. So I will let them give more detail about their background and their programs, but I'm very glad to have you both here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, you want to go a little bit about your background and Sure. Um, so I, um, I am now the public education coordinator. I started with Doombrook eight years ago um, as a um, parenting teacher um, going into homes of mandated families who had been mandated by the state for, for services. And so I would go in and teach parenting classes um, about six years ago. I started doing uh, the body safety program. So um, do you want to introduce, do you want to talk about your role at Doombrook, Jean Ann, or do you want me to just go right into body safety? <laughs> well, why don't you go into body safety and then I'll, I'll chat after you. Okay, so um, just to give a little bit of history, which you guys, some of you may or may not know, um, about 15 years ago, the Doonland Exchange Club introduced the Doonland schools to Doonbrook. Um, and that was the beginning of our very long-standing partnership in on our fight against child abuse. Um, 
the Doonland Exchange Club saw Doombrook's program as an opportunity to get out there and, and send a very, very important and valuable message in helping keeping kids safe. Um, in about, at about 2015, I started doing the presentations um, and I also brought in some evidence-based curriculum uh, called Safer Smarter Kids. And I started blending that with the script that we, we were using from Terry Hall. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, Terry Hall, um, he is a retired Indiana State detective and he worked in crimes against children for many, many years. Um, and then when he moved into retirement, he started doing presentations, body safety presentations at schools in Northwest Indiana. Um, he is a very passionate and devoted man in, in, the, in our work against keeping kids safe, um, specifically focusing on sexual abuse prevention. Um, so he created a script for us many years ago that I still use big pieces of it with our elementary program um, and telling him his story, his personal story about his, his history of abuse and how he um, became a police officer and wanted to work with kids and keep it safe. Um, but then also, like I said, blending in some of this evidence-based program um, to kind of adhere to the state mandate that requires all schools to provide some kind of um, sexual abuse prevention education to their students. Um, our presentations are geared towards groups um, using appropriate social and emotional development. Um, they, of course, are um, age appropriate and they grow with the kids as they get a little bit older. Um, but our goal is to educate them on how to protect themselves from the potential threat of sexual abuse, but also what to do if they have been a victim of sexual abuse. Um, so as you guys know, sexual abuse is one of the biggest issues that children face today with the most serious array of consequences. They estimate that one in three girls and one in five boys will experience some form of sexual abuse before they turn 18. And that is a national um, statistic. Um, I read the other day in well, one of the reviews that I was doing uh, that there are currently 42 million survivors of sexual abuse living in the country right now. And what makes that even, even scarier is they also estimate that 33% of cases are never disclosed. So 33% of the time, the child never comes forward with what's happened to them. Um, so this is why we aim to go into the schools and do these interactive presentations to equip kids with the skills and knowledge to be able to protect themselves um, if they are in potentially threatening situations um, or if they're living in the care of their abuser. Um, our curriculum covers an array of topics which include body identification, which is talking about what the proper terms are for the private parts. Uh, we do body empowerment, body boundaries and autonomy. We talk about seeking help and identifying who trusted adults are in their life, um, not only in their home, but also outside their home, which at the school um, is one of our first lines of defense. Oftentimes kids are more comfortable disclosing to somebody at their school or somebody like me who, who comes in and talks specifically about sexual abuse. So we really emphasize with the kids, who are your go-to people at home, but who's also your go-to support team outside your home. And another part of that is because 90% of victims know their perpetrator. 90% of the time, it's somebody that lives in their home. It's somebody that they have a relationship with them, somebody who has access to that child. And so that's another piece of why it's so important to help the child, especially at the elementary level, identify who they can go to outside their home. Um, we also talk about identifying what potential perpetrators look like. Um, at the younger level, elementary, oftentimes they think it's some big scary stranger. So our goal is to go in there and help them be realistic about what these people can potentially look like. And the reality is they can look like anybody. It can be anybody. And so we really want kids to focus not about what the person looks like, but how they make them feel um, and what they're doing. So if it's making you feel unsafe or uncomfortable, are they doing things that are inappropriate or not okay? That's the red flag that we want them to be aware of and then go talk to somebody. And these are proactive preventative skills that we're teaching them to hopefully stop 
sexual abuse from potentially ever happening, um, to give them the skills to recognize threatening situations and, and to seek out help if, if they need it. Um, that is also the introduction into talking about what grooming is. Um, and we want kids to understand at a young but appropriate age how to recognize grooming tactics, because that is how perpetrators target their victims. Um, and then also that leads into conversation about red flags. You know, if you are seeing warning signs or if your gut, we talk a lot about gut instinct and inner voice. If that's going off, that's something that you need to pay attention to and then take it back to who are you gonna talk to? Who are the trusted adults? Um, so that's really kind of the gist of our body safety program, which again is for our elementary students. And we do cover all of the Duneland schools um, I was actually just at Bailey and Yoast uh, last week. And um, our Stewards of Children program, um, I'll talk about, about that before I talk about Safer Smarter Teens. But our Stewards of Children program is our sexual abuse prevention education training, mouthful, sorry, for adults. So it's our training that is evidence-based. Um, it's for adults and helping them learn how to recognize and respond appropriately respond to suspicions of sexual abuse, um, a child discloses sexual abuse to um, an adult or you witness it. Um, about four years ago, I started working with the Doonland Exchange Club and the Doonland Schools to, to offer this to all of um, the staff, all of the teachers and staff in the Doonland Schools. And our idea behind it was that we wanted to come in at an all-inclusive approach. We wanted to educate the children, we wanted to educate the teachers, we wanted to educate the community. And the way to do that was provide education to everybody. Um, long time ago, I, I read something that said, abuse thrives in secrecy, and that's what it is. When we don't talk about it, when we don't um, give ourselves the opportunity to learn about how to keep ourselves safe and our children safe, that's what perpetrators are looking for. They're looking for opportunity where there's secrets, where there's lack of knowledge, where there's lack of resources, where there's lack of education. And so by working with you guys in the Doolin schools, we felt like we, we were gonna be loud about it and we were gonna talk about it a lot and we were gonna put it out there because that's how we were gonna keep our kids safe. That's how we were gonna keep the community safe. Um, and I, I can see the difference between communities that are, are talking about this a lot and that this is an annual thing for their students and their teachers versus just coming into new communities that I, I'm working with. Um, with the Safer Smarter Teens um, program, so in about two, around 2018, I started moving into the middle, middle schools. Um, and I found a curriculum, which is, from the same uh, authors as Safer Smarter Kids. It's called Safer Smarter Teens. And again, it is evidence-based uh, for sixth grade through eighth grade. Um, and I go into the schools and I teach usually um, health class or gym class is what I do with the Doonland schools. So they come down and we do a two-day presentation. Um, and we talk about a lot of the same things that we're talking about in elementary school, but then we're also incorporating things like personal power, um, privacy, body boundaries, um, again, really getting into what sexual abuse is, um, grooming tactics, more, more information about grooming and red flags, um, and then also internet safety, because internet um, has become a huge issue, and it's become a breeding ground for perpetrators to target their victims, whether it's through social media or it's through video games that are, are children's games, but they are finding opportunity for them to target kids, pretending catfishing, yeah, pretending to be somebody that they're not, and kids, especially vulnerable kids that are playing a lot of games and feel kind of isolated, and this is their, their outlet, this is how they connect, um, they're sharing information and they're, they're sharing personal information, which sometimes turns into sharing pictures which sometimes turns into meeting up with people that they don't know, strangers, which seems just unreal to me to do, but to them, it seems like it's an okay idea because this person has groomed them to believe that they're a safe person. So we do talk a lot about internet safety and we, we talk a lot about sexting. Sexting 
at the middle school and high school level has become a profound problem where they're sending each other inappropriate images and these images, uh, you know, they're obviously of somebody under the age of 18. And we do talk about how that is considered child pornography. That's a, a very serious crime. They're sending them, they're sharing them, and they are getting out of control. They're going to thousands and thousands of student cell phones. And so our conversation with these middle schoolers and high school is just about the danger and permanency of these things. And not knowing when you send that, who's going to get it next. Um, and so we talk a lot about that. Um, unfortunately, last year I was invited to go to the high school, uh, Chesterton High School, to uh, present our, our high school program, but it got canceled due to COVID. Um, but we, I will be working towards scheduling them in the springtime um, because the, the high school was excited to have us come. They were excited about the curriculum. Um, uh, side note, another important component of the high school curriculum is talking about safe and unsafe relationships, consent, um, advocating for others, a big conversation, you know, advocating either for your friends or if you have younger siblings, um, and of course, the internet component of it as well. Um, so, like I said, we will be uh, scheduling sometime in the springtime just when they get back to a little bit of normalcy um, and and have the time to have presenter come and, and do a presentation for them in a safe so social distancing manner. Um, just to make sure I covered, I had made notes and then I get lost. <laughs> um, so with COVID, I guess that's kind of a good segue into that part of um, our changes this year. In years past, we've always done large group assemblies. Um, usually when I would go to the elementary schools, I would group the kids, kindergarten and first grade were together, second and third grade, and then fourth grade, um, and then individual classes for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, now with COVID, putting some safety restrictions, obviously, on, on large group assemblies, and even sometimes letting anybody into their buildings, into the school, we have offered to do individual class presentations. Um, which is Doonland is doing some of those, or they're also doing um, the presentations in the cafeteria where the students will go and sit at their assigned lunch seat. Um, and that way they can do any tracing if there has been exposure to COVID um, and we can still do each individual grade level. Um, with the high school at Valpo, I ended up making a pre-recorded video um, which wasn't my first option, but we got to have to kind of roll with the punches and it did go well. So um, in working with Chesterton High School, I will offer that as well. If we're getting to the point where they're just not going to be able to have somebody come in and do individual presentations because at that level, at the high school level, I'm there for two days for every class period to be able to get to ninth grade through 12th grade. Um, so we're just we're trying to be as flexible as possible. And I think the best part is that the schools, especially Doonlin, still finds this program to be such a priority for their students and that are, are doing anything that they can to make sure that we are able to present to them this year. So we're just working really hard together to find a, a spot in the schedule with the constant changes. And it's going well, I've got everybody scheduled um, except and have done everybody except for the high school yet. So that's that's on our agenda. Um, with the next question that you guys were asking uh, with the results of our program, um, it's really hard to measure something like this. It's really hard to measure the impact that you're having. I mean, it's really almost impossible to measure if or does this reduce the numbers of victims. I mean, in my heart, I say, yes, it does. I, I've seen it work, um, but to be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter if we're helping a hundred kids or we're helping one kid. The point is we're helping somebody. We are stopping changing somebody's life that they don't have to endure the abuse um, or they can find safety 
somewhere. And I think that's all we really need to know. And other, you know, this is a really hard conversation. And I've met a lot of parents that do a great job talking to their kids. But to be perfectly honest, I mean, if I didn't do this for a living, I'm not sure how I would talk to my girls about it. I mean, I really only know all this because this is my career. This is what I've chosen to do with my life. But there's not a whole lot of resources out there for parents to be able to talk to their kids. And so not only are we in the schools talking to them, but we also do parent information nights where they can come and ask me questions about what I'm going to be talking to their kids about. And I can also give them tips on how do you continue the conversation at home? You know, how do you answer the questions from your eight-year-old who seems very scared and upset by this? And they can be, absolutely, but how do you handle it? And that's, that's what we're aiming to do is not just giving the kids information, but helping parents kind of support this program at home too. Um, and, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long, I feel like a long time. And I will say at every school, I've had to make a report. At some schools, I've made multiple reports. And so that, I think, in itself shows that, you know, I've had a, a child who saw the presentation for three years, and the abuse was going on for three years. And she, that child, sorry, was not comfortable coming forward until that third year. And so I think that another important piece of it is just doing it every single year. This isn't a conversation that you have once and go, I'm done. That's enough. You got it. You have to keep talking to them about it. You have to keep repeating it and, and making yourself available to ask questions. And I think not only is that what we're able to do, but I feel very supported by the teachers and the counselors at the Dunland schools that they do that even when we're not there, which is, it's just incredible. It's such a team effort. I really feel very blessed to work with this, this staff. And I talk a lot. So now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> No, uh, you're doing a great job, Sierra. I can pop in and do number four if you want. Okay, I think that would be give oh. yourself a, give you a little break there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I want to start out and by saying um, it has been five years, Jackie, and I'm going on my sixth. Um, and it, I I say this from the bottom of my heart, Jackie. When I started, we had some funding issues with body safety, and Jackie was adamant. You were just adamant. This program is not going to be, it's going to happen. We're not going to pause on this. And uh, it made me work really hard. But when I look at all of you, and I have addressed your group in person years ago, I mean, you are just such a fabulous group. And you're so progressive thinking that you do our hearts good. I mean, because this is what it's about. And I'm going to tell you just very briefly my background. I grew up in Michigan City, um, went to college. I worked in business in Chicago. In fact, I sold computers to doctor's offices and had a five-state region. And I had a light bulb moment after being in that job for years and said I need to do something different. Went back to school, got a, a degree in, uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I did some school counseling um, back then. Ended up working my dad's, you know, people go into counseling for a reason. Um, my dad is a recovering, was a recovering alcoholic. And uh, I say that because when, so I in business, left, went back and got a master's degree, worked in the school system, then worked in a couple different treatment centers, and then went back, got married, uh, and did school counseling for over 20 years and did a private practice. And our passion, when you hear Sarah talk, and really the directors here and most of our staff, our passion comes, which is very similar to all of you and Mac, a teacher and Emily and Shannon and Mark, you know, you all know that when you teach in this issue, you have a sense this issue is a problem. You just want to help them. You know, it's like substance abuse. There's help out there, but when people are in it, they don't know that. So when Sarah talks about, you know, it really is a family issue and oftentimes the child 90% of the time they know the perpetrator. So the beauty in what we do, if you would, is that it doesn't have to be this way. And the more we educate, so when Sarah says, you know, is it effective? Yeah, you have disclosures and people go to jail for this. Ultimately, yes, that happens. But the widespread people, groups like yours that educate themselves about 
the data, I mean, we did 422 interviews in the Child Advocacy Center last year. That is only the tip of the iceberg of suspected cases. So that's the intervention piece. But when you do what Sarah does and this, and you all, if you haven't seen Sarah and you wanna go see her sometime, and you school people know, there are very few people that can talk about an issue in front of children and be effective. Sarah's fabulous, and especially with this fragile issue. So to keep their attention, have them take it seriously. And she has a reputation now of integrity in, in what she does. So she's a gem, I just want to say. But so anyway, that's where the passion comes from. And, it, you know, I'll meet people at a party or something. They'll ask me what I do and I'll say child abuse and their mouth just drops like, oh gosh. You know, but I get excited about it because like substance abuse, when that issue is in the home and you don't know what to do about it, we can change lives by helping people understand that there are options, both children who can finally speak up for themselves, but parents who maybe were affected themselves or have an inkling that something's going on. And to be honest with you, school personnel, I've done presentations to bus drivers for Michigan City Area Schools. They know when a kid walks on a bus, they have a suspicion something's happening. So you know, if I could leave you with anything, it would be if you see something, say something. People are very hesitant to say something. Why is that? We don't want to diagnose. Maybe he did fall down the stairs at home, but maybe he didn't. So when people see something and make a report with Department of Child Services, they see a pattern then. Well, gosh, six months ago, we got a call about little Johnny and it didn't appear to be a big deal, but here it is, you know, two years later, we're getting another call, another call. So, you know, when we talk about uh, number four, are there any programs that deal with physical and emotional abuse that our club could consider? I really believe that they're all intertwined, the physical and the emotional. And when we get, Sarah will be able to tell you this, the Child Advocacy Center, when we do an interview, we, we do a lot of referrals out for community, we collaborate with the other agencies in your community and refer out for all those issues. Um, you know, the CAC does talk about physical and I really believe when Sarah does these presentations, it empowers the child to say, if something's wrong, hmm, maybe I should say something about it. Whether it's emotional, maybe they have a mom or a dad just constantly pounding them into the ground emotionally let alone physically or sexually. So I really do believe the education piece covers it. Um, but so anyway, uh, off track, but that's a little bit about my background. And I was going along happy as a clam with my private practice and being a school counselor. And someone came to me from this board. And as a counselor, school counselor, and as a teacher, you all, you know, you save individual lives by referring them and getting them help. But what we do at Doonbrook is so widespread and global to me. That's why I just love what we do. Um, but it is getting people on board. If you've ever seen the movie, and I probably talk about this called Spotlight. I don't know if, if any of you have ever seen it. It's an old movie and it was about early 90s when the Catholic Church and all the priests and incest and the Boston Globe had a, a group called uh, the Spotlight and they would do investigative reporting. So it's the idea, that's why I love your group so much. It's not so much, if you would, the gore of the abuse, but the way a community gets together to say, gosh, maybe we should talk about this. Where's the legal system, you know, on this issue? Do we have prosecuting attorneys that aren't, you know, are they're looking the other way or a political entity that don't want to deal with it? But you have a social service agency like yourselves who you're very powerful voice in a lot of different avenues. So for you to be open-minded and say, hey, it is an issue in our community. We don't need to be ashamed about it. And there's answers for it. And that's so exciting. So I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, from the bottom of my heart for even having us. And I, I know, Lorelai, I mean, and J, you know, when you talk about it, you're passionate. And, and it's this issue or any other issue to say, let's not be embarrassed, let's talk about it. And is it comfortable? No. Um, so if you see something, say something. And the power of the innocent bystander, you know, in schools, 
It's the old bully situation. You know, gosh, someone sees someone bullying. If you see something, say something to someone. Um, you know, in other words, take self-responsibility for trying to help this situation. But for question number four, I don't know, does anyone have any questions about what I just said or any piece of what I said? What I was thinking is if everybody could write down their questions and we would do a, a Q oh, and A at okay. the at the end. So make sure that we get through your content and then great. be it. And, and, you know, we end at eight, but we can go beyond that because I, you know, I've got questions that I know that I'm already sure. interested in asking. And both of you, just so you know, are doing a fantastic job and we just appreciate it. This is just so, <laughs> so fa usually we give you like 10 minutes to try to get all this in. <laughs> yeah. So just to be able to have a, a longer conversation has been really yeah. cool. I well, feel I much more relaxed. Usually I'm like, yeah. get through this. This is, <laughs> I have to yeah, yeah. slow down. Well, there's so many, there's so many pieces of it. So I'll just real quickly on that number four, to answer your question, are there any other programs that deal with physical and emotional abuse their club can consider? You know, absolutely. I mean, there's um, shelters, women's shelters, Stepping Stone, Women's Care Center, both in your, your county and LaPorte County, school counselors. I mean, to do training for school people because they're the ones who see kids. Just like example being me doing the presentation to, I mean, well, there was a hundred bus drivers. We had groups of 25. But for to give them the green light to say, you don't need to diagnose that it's abuse. But if you think there's an issue, say something to someone. Go mm -hmm. tell the principal, tell a teacher, not the parent, but go tell someone. So churches, um, in hospitals, social service agencies at hospitals, it's all about educating. You'd be surprised the number of doctors who don't even want to deal with the issue. So, you know, in all those entities, school settings, churches, I did a presentation to a community of church people who, you know, and granted it was a bit ago, but they just didn't want to acknowledge it was a problem. So when you drop some of those statistics, even in the nicest of communities, it's an issue. It's just like substance abuse. You know, sometimes people just don't want to acknowledge that the quality of their life is not what it, it should be. So I would say there are definitely a lot of other agencies, you know, if you're looking to get into. And real briefly, and Sarah can answer this with number five, but uh, Angie Marsh, who's director of our child advocacy center that does the interviews, um, as far as you asked Lorelai, is there anything, you know, legislatively or anything you could be doing like does department of child do their their job and i i think department of child services i remember when i was in the school system i'd make reports and i'm like oh man they're not on top of this they didn't get back to me what's the deal here well they do a good job some some um i can tell you porter county dc they're good, great i i um i think they're sometimes misunderstood. Oftentimes because of confidentiality, they can't get back to you on things. But the key is that if you're still seeing a problem and you've made a report to keep talking about it, keep reaching out and saying something. Um, they don't wanna take children out of the home um, if they can you know, not have that happen because that's so bad. And yet I know I had students that they stayed in homes that were bad, even if just emotional abuse. So I think, you know, we make the report to Department of Child Services, they do the investigating, we do the interviews. Um, so I think they do their job. Are they overburdened and overworked? Absolutely. You know, and is there a lot of um, um, turnover because the job's rough? Yep, there is. So, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't still get people help because there's a lot of, you know, it's like a grab bag of um, ways to get people help. So I, I've, had, I've had people in the neighborhood, someone's neighborhood of a child they thought was getting abused, call me as a school counselor and say, I can't give you any, my name, but I'm going to tell you what I'm observing. And don't think I didn't go to respected teachers and say, keep your eye on Johnny. I got this call, blah, blah, blah. Now you have to be careful you don't pigeonhole or you know give a kid a reputation that is inappropriate. There's a lot we really can do. It's having the courage to speak up and you don't have to be on target or know exactly what's going on. So that is really, uh, that would be my, my message. Well, and I think that Jeannie Ann brings up um, a couple of really good points is 
a lot of people don't understand how the system works and they're reluctant to make reports because they don't want to be a part of it and they they don't have all the facts and i think something that we we could put out to the community and i i don't know how to to approach it but would be having D the department of child services explain how it works that when you call and make a report whatever kind of whether it's sexual abuse physical abuse emotional abuse whether you witnessed it or you have a suspicion that you're protected by law for for making a report in good faith mm -hmm. and that you don't have to go in with all of the facts that that's why you're handing over the information that you have because you're requesting a service you're requesting for a professional to come out and do their job, which is the investigation. And I think a lot of people, whether it's professionals or just parents or neighbors, they don't see that that's how it works. And so they're reluctant to make a report because they don't know that. And a lot of times they don't even know that they can do it anonymously. They think that they have to give their name and that becomes a barrier. No, I don't want anybody to know I did that. And the truth is you don't have to give your name. You can absolutely report anonymously. So I think that as a club, you know, again, I'm not sure how to approach it, but I think just having, getting that information out there, having the Department of Child Services explain, you know, how this works. And I think when people are informed, they're more likely to be able to help when they, when they know that they need to help. Um, there was also, and I, Jackie, I will send you her name because I can't think of it. There was a presenter that came last year to Westchester Intermediate and uh, Chesterton Middle School, maybe even some of the elementaries. And sh she works for the police uh, department and she does presentations on internet safety. And she was amazing. And I think a lot of the parents attended in Chesterton. And so I think uh, I'm hoping that she comes back and that might be something that the exchange club would be interested in and in supporting as well. Cause she did a phenomenal job. I watched those kids go oh, and they, and they're thinking twice about how they're using their phone and how they're mm -hmm. engaging in their games and their social media. So I'm sorry, I don't have her name here, but I will get it to you because I think that the exchange club would possibly be interested in supporting that as well, because that is a great opportunity um, for keeping kids safe in the digital world, which is mm -hmm. new to all of us, but is their everyday reality. Well, thank you both. Um, I, so I would like to open it up for questions. And so this, just to start us off with, um, you know, Sarah and, and Jean Ann, you both talked about how, like the Stewards for Children, you, you wanna get that program out to the community. And I know you're getting it to the staff and the counselors and the teachers um, at the school. Um, but the, the power of digital, which has, it also has the bad side, which is what you just talked about, but there's the power of digital is being able to do programs like this, where mm -hmm. you not only record it, but then you can have people attend live, yeah. record it, and then be able to get it out there and get it shared and, and all of that. Um, would that be something that you guys would consider on a couple of topics? One, the Stewards for Children program. Uh, number two, on a program specifically on how to teach parents and how to have that touch that tough conversation. You mentioned that parents don't know how to have that conversation, right? Um, and I know when the parents come for that school night, I don't know how deep you get into that and how many parents actually come. But I think some of the programs that you're doing, I think if we could start to do those digitally mm -hmm. and, and get those out, um, the whole, you know, a lot of times people are kind of just shocked by what they find out. I mean, you said the sexting is a profound problem, profound. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's one of those things that I think we need to start educating the community on. And I'm just wondering if we could have a series of programs with you guys where we are inviting the public to come, that's the whole goal, mm -hmm. and then recording it and then being able to get it out there. Because it just seems like these are programs that, you know, they're going on in the schools, but I bet you most people just don't have yeah. an idea. Yeah. Lorelai, yeah. I, I would say one thing, um, for instance, and Sarah has done this before, but there we have a new program starting next month, um, a, a parent and family education program where we're teaching parenting classes. Mm -hmm. And as an evidence-based, we just hired a new person. She was just trained. It's called the Nurturing Parenting Curriculum. It's a national evidence-based program. We have found, though, in the past that 
in Sarah knows this, where we put a flyer at say the library and saying we're having this parenting, there's 10 sessions and you get one or two people mm -hmm. or they don't stay the whole time. So we really need, and your help would be great, all of you, if you have ideas, is to go to a captured audience example being mm -hmm. a school system when we need to investigate you know work with sarah and all of you on um aside from this but this parenting education program where but it's one funding it two who would come mm -hmm. you know it's voluntary but for instance like salvation army they have a captured audience or a woman's care center where they're already hooked into, if you would, trying to improve themselves and getting help. So um, keep that in mind because it would touch on these areas that Sarah is talking about. You know, it's like how many parents are going to come to a presentation? Maybe virtually they would. Mm -hmm. um, that talks about abuse. You know, mm -hmm. well, why are you here? I mean, people don't even want their car in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. in, you know, it's the whole social stigma thing. So how you market it is very interesting. Yeah, and, and I think those are some conversations that I think we need to have because I think the the stats are just shocking. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't think people know that. I think and I think people are sometimes we have our head on, you know, what, what yeah. is our head in the sand and or yeah. we don't want to know. Sometimes we just don't want to know. Mac, right. you have a question. I see your hand up, Max. And so I'll turn that over to you, Mac. I uh a couple of years ago approached uh our own club about possibly putting together public service announcements to mm -hmm. slip into that time slot where people who are having trouble in life seem to dwell. Uh -huh. And uh, we had some interest from Ball State University and we had some interest from a few Indianapolis television uh, channels, but it never went anywhere. I don't know if it was my fault or someone else's, but it, it never came to fruition. Have you tried uh, doing public service announcements or anything like yeah. that? You, you know, when COVID hit, um, we listened to, I'm really proud of this. Um, we listened to a chamber webinar that said, you've got to get on social media. So every Tuesday, and of course, Jackie's been on it, Lorley, you know, Every Tuesday, we highlight a community person and interview them live, um, Mac. And that is exactly what they do. And we put that on Facebook. So you don't have to be listening at Tuesday at 10. That's what the show's called. But we get a community person. So if any of you are interested in being on that, would love to interview you. But the cool part about that is then it hits social media and it's continuing to go. So people can get onto it anytime. And that's really weird you know, you need to, to do these days. So we do do that. Um, Healthy Families, the one where we go into the homes and teach parenting skills for free, and that's a state-run evidence-based program. We had a billboard campaign. You just don't find, you know, general marketing stuff for this is kind of a, mm, doesn't work so well. Mm -hmm. You almost have to target your market and then do it in a way that, uh, you know, as you say, Mackie, you almost have to hook them in a way that's, I don't know, how do you say? And I think that's what's the power of like Facebook is that the demographics, yeah. you can pick people that are in the Duneland area that are parents, yeah. you know, of mm -hmm. kids of this age and stuff. So I do think that mm -hmm. is the power of, of social media. Um, is there any other questions uh, from anybody else in terms of, Sarah has a question. I do <laughs> have a question. Um, no, but I, I just wanted to kind of piggyback off what you were saying, Lorelai, with, with the change uh, of having to utilize, you know, virtual outlets like Zoom meetings, we are able to reach more people. And mm -hmm. I think that it has created a, an incredible opportunity for things like parent information night, um, where, or stewards of children, I can now, I can train people virtually through our stewards program. We don't have to go, you know, face to face. So it has created a, a, a different platform that actually reaches more, more people than we wanted, because, you know, I've always wanted to do, you know, small parent, bigger, small parent groups where they come and we can talk about continuing that conversation and talk about education on, on, on abuse prevention. And I think that Zoom gives us the opportunity to do that. They don't have to leave their home and they mm -hmm. can 
they can have this meeting with us. And I think that that is a, something that we really could and should look like look at in the future. Right. Absolutely. And, I, and the thing is, is once you, you have it recorded and then you can just keep sharing it and somebody yep. else can share it and you can watch it at your leisure and, and so forth. So I just think that there is a great opportunity um, and you've, you've got, the, you've got the programs, right. And yep. they're working and we know they're yep. effective. Now let's figure out how we can broaden that audience. We are going to be scheduling just so you know, cause one of you, I think Sarah, you may have mentioned it or um, Jean Ann is um, I have contacted one of our local judges who deals with this in her court. Um, and she suggested that we do a panel and we bring the prosecutor's office in, maybe somebody from the caring place. So that is one that we are uh, trying to assemble right now. So, so I, I think that's another one in Wonderful. terms of being more educated in terms of what's going on. And then um, totally forgot the other one. So, but we are moving forward in that area. We have a, a another counselor that's going to be coming in and talking about that. Does she does counseling with Trump? Uh, kids that are traumatized, hmm. you know, and, and what that looks like and, and so forth. So we have some, I think some really good uh, speakers that are lined up on this topic, but I don't think you guys are gonna get off the hook because I think we're going to end up using you uh, much more than we anticipated. So good. I, I like to hear that. <laughs> that's good. Um, I want to open this up to still other questions that you guys have out there. I mean, the, the information has just been so awesome. I, I saw the program when we first did it 15 years ago. So it's been a while since I, I've seen it, but I went to both the parent night and this was when it first started. So parents were a little bit, Jackie, this is when even the principals were a little bit concerned, right? So right. parents were really, you know, turning out and it was amazing how quickly they were calmed because I think just, again, the statistics were pretty shocking to them. And then, and I think I saw the kindergarten and first grade group and just how well you guys do that program. And it, it's, it's actually a phenomenal program. Thank you. It it is. I feel very, and Jeannie Ann does too. I, I say this all the time. I genuinely love my job. I really do. And I, I love talking to kids. I love, you know, I, another part of how I know it's working is the way they engage. I mean, the fact that they're, we're talking about something that's not easy for us to talk about sometimes even forces us to choke up because it's, it's so difficult to talk about and they're asking questions and they're engaged and the responses they give like when I ask the question, you know, why do you think kids may not tell a trusted adult that it's happened to them? Why do you think they keep it a secret? And the responses they give just, I mean, they give me goosebumps. If they're, they're thinking about it and they're empathizing with other kids. Maybe they didn't go through it, but they can understand if they had a friend that went through it. And I think that's just really incredible to, to witness. Sarah, when you say at every school you go to at least one child, I think you said comes forward to talk to you. Out of all those kids that come forward, how many of them do end up being an actual, I mean, you know, some of them may not know and they, they're asking you, does, does this make sense? But how many of them do end up going further down in the system in terms of needing to get further help and in, in investigating? Um, so I think last year um, I was scheduled at 65 schools and I think I made 15 reports to the hotline. Now, what the state did with those, um, I don't usually know mm -hmm. after that, unless they contact me, the caseworker will sometimes contact me to find out if I need to add any other information from the disclosure. Um, but we have seen plenty of cases each year um, that come to our forensic center and the child mentions the body safety program mm -hmm. in some capacity, whether they mentioned it to their caseworker, they mention it during their forensic interview, just saying that they they said something after they saw the body safety presentation. So I, I think what we're gonna move into doing next year is that I'm gonna work a little closer with the advocacy center in tracking that information. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have to keep it um, you know, confidential, but we can still track numbers to just kind of see, so how many of them are coming to the forensic center? How many of them are doing an interview? Um, because I know 15 reports, the hotline, maybe not all of them were substantiated, mm -hmm. you know. I do know when we first started, um, we we're having trouble getting, we were in one school and, and we we're having trouble getting back into that school. And one of the teachers approached me and said, Lorelai, what's going on? We're waiting for the body safety program. And I was trying to explain to her that we were having issues for whatever it was getting into that school. And she said, we really need that program because we do suspect 
that there is a child that is being sexually abused. And we really feel that having you guys come in and give the program will hopefully give that child the courage to come forward. So they didn't, they didn't know for sure. And again, if it's not physical, there may not be something that they're seeing. And so they really felt that this program was so critical. And, And from my perspective, it's like, wow, you know, you just didn't realize how important this was. I mean, I knew how important it was, but I mean, teachers are depending Mm-hmm. on this program to help yeah. them in terms of helping identify what's going on. Yeah. So, and that was years ago. So I, I knew immediately the, the impact that we were having. Right. Yeah. And it was, I mean, you guys, like we talked about from the beginning, the exchange club was, you guys were the first, first group to welcome us because everybody else was like, oh, I don't know. They're talking about penis and vagina and sexual abuse. And they were just said no. And you guys saw it as, truly an opportunity to help kids. And I, I really, I didn't even get into the Valpo schools until a couple of years ago. And I kept telling them, I'm like, well, Chesterton lets us do it. So <laughs> they finally let us in. The, the early years were very different. Um, I have to give compliments to Dr. Bear for any that you remember him. Mm-hmm. Oh, he yeah. was forward thinking. Yeah. And um, he really helped make that happen. And um we had to bring the teachers together and they were reluctant, the principals, the principals, they were reluctant. They were like, what's this going to do the class, you know, to the classroom and the rest of the day is going to be shot. They were more worried about that. Yeah. So it was, it took a little bit of time to grow and I had to step in every once in a while and kind of throw some weight around whatever it was worth (laughs) to (laughs) nudge somebody to get scheduled or something like that. But I I really don't have any role in it anymore. You guys just run it so effortlessly. And I think that's because both the school recognizes the benefit to them and their students as, as it does student work. So yeah, it really has been, I had sixth graders. I was at Westchester intermediate and I had sixth graders and it dawned on me that I've seen them every year since kindergarten and they all know me. And I, I think that that's, what's really been awesome and seeing it grow is that, and they're going to see me until they graduate high school. And so they, (laughs) they do know me as, a trusted adult. They also know me as the weird body safety lady, but they have that trust in me. And I think that that translates into having trust into other adults Mm -hmm. in their life too. And and I would add Jackie, when you talk about that, yeah, I forgot to tell you all when I was expecting our children, I did part-time counseling in Liberty in Westchester. Now my youngest is 21 years old, so it's been a while, but my point is I read, in any school system, you get that pushback. And mm-hmm. still you get that pushback. That is not just, you know, 15 years ago. Well, and I think that was one of the issues is that some people thought, well, gosh, if you have the conversation, are you going to be planting the seed? And, you know, oh gosh, yeah. oh yeah, you know, so, yeah. so it, it just, again, just a little bit more, more conservative old yes. school, like, oh my gosh, yes. are we going to create a problem that doesn't exist? Right. Yeah. So, but it's the That's opposite. True. So the, those are things, but get, uh, kudos to Jackie for having the the ability to continue to push forward, you yeah. know, because it, obviously Jackie had some people pushing against you and the fact that you're like, no, we got to do this. And now look at where we're at, you know. It's huge. So I will ask any more, uh, Pam, you have a question? Well, it's not as much of a question as it is a comment. I would love to see, you know, we have this great new website And we have a really pretty strong Facebook presence uh, with our Facebook members um, and everybody that we've invited to be with it and then their friends and their friends. I would love to be able to pair up, see us pair up with some of these messages from Sarah and Jean Ann and um, blast them out our way too you know Mm -hmm. they talked about them doing their um their interviews and their seminars and things and doing it on their page but i think uh we'd also be really great at getting out some of this messages through some of our uh social networking Mm -hmm. yeah and that's great And, and i think the verbiage you use you know empowering children Mm -hmm. to speak Mm -hmm. up when something's wrong you start out with a really soft kind of thing like that you know I mean it's important to say child abuse and so forth at one point but 
to hook them. And can I just say, Marsha had put in the chat, what about churches? And I, I have actually gone and, and spoken to churches, Marsha. I'd be happy to do that with any church that you're thinking of. Um, yeah, and it could be a, a slant on any one of the, 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 the pieces of this topic. Sorry, Absolutely. Sarah. Marcia, I do trainings. I do stewards trainings at, at churches uh, pretty often. I haven't done one in a while just because of all the changes, but um, you, you contact me anytime, anybody contact me anytime. If you have a group that would like to go through the training, um, we have funding that that pays for you guys to be able to go through the training. So if you've got a group of 10 or more, I usually kind of cap it out at 30 just because too many people, then we kind of lose in, in the conversation, but I'll come back for multiple. And it's just a great way to get people trained on something that, you know, can make a, a big difference. Great, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions before we, I know you guys have had a long day and, uh, but before we let Jean Ann and uh, Sarah go, any other questions or comments? Comment. You guys are awesome. I love what you're doing, and I'm happy that we're part of it. So. That's great. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Paula. Um, I was gonna say, you know, Sarah. Like I said, Sarah and I are are our best friends, and so we've talked about this before, especially uh, through Westville. Um, she's tried to contact our counselor and to no, to no avail, unfortunately. Um, and I, I think with COVID and everything else, it's kind of been uh, put on hold. But I wonder if um, a reminder to you, Sarah, that we can't um, either get some more information to Kim Wilkinson, who is our school counselor, yes. but also not only for the children, which I know is... Um, <clears throat> I know is the focus for most of your body safety presentations, but I wonder, um, our school is really big on professional development. And if there isn't a way for us to have a meeting um, where we are offering it to the teachers as well so that they know what it's about and, um, or maybe even parents too, I don't really know how we would mm -hmm. do that, um, to offer it to them so that they can, you know, teachers like to get something for their time spent, yeah. you know, yeah. outside of school. Um, and a couple of PD hours is really helpful. And then, then they can have a better understanding of what this program is about so that they can then push forward because I know I have a lot of teachers, if not all of them, that once they heard um, that this has been presented and, and we just haven't had any contact, um, but that they know more about the program that they, um, the teachers being, you know, arguably the biggest advocates in these kids' lives, aside from their loved ones, Absolutely, um, that they can then push for, okay, well, we've heard about it. So, so why aren't we doing it and, and getting it out to them as well? Um, so I think maybe if, if you want to email me any information, or if you want me to approach Kim tomorrow and tell her, you know, what we talked about today, and that um, I have not taking the time out of my day to tell her how important it is to me as well. Mm -hmm. And I always say the Doolin Exchange Club, but, you know, like Mac had said, um, kind of in a way, you know, we're, we're a national club. This is a, this is a global thing, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know, child abuse is not, I'm not just looking to reach Doolin area students. Yeah. Um, you know, this is something that across the board, um, we and could be Emily, pushing Emily, for. Emily, so. I would say too, you know, when you talk to her, they need to hear that Sarah can adapt to whatever their needs are. Yes. You know, whatever their time, right, Sarah? And Sarah does yeah. a good job oh. of saying, okay, if we only have next semester and we only have a few hours, what can we do? Or next fall, what, you know, mm -hmm. so we have to be, oh my gosh, because you, you know, Emily, they're, they freak out with trying to fit things in the schedule, especially. The oh time. yeah. There's no time for anything. Yeah. We just There's make it work somehow. Yeah. yeah, and that's, my, I, I think we should absolutely, I mean, if, when they can see the program and they get, you know, they can do their continuing education points for it, and then they have a better great, understanding yeah. and recognition of, okay, now let's pass it on to the kids and, yeah. and make that right. time, make it happen. Because they're, I mean, they're obviously seeing things all the time, and I can't imagine that any of my, my teachers in my demographic especially aren't seeing something kind of concerning mm -hmm. every day. I mean, I have middle schoolers. So like I had said, so there's always something. So who knows? Always something. <laughs> yeah. something. Um, Sarah, so do yeah, they get more education? 
do do others do you ever does would Doomland allow other schools to come in and see the program in our school? So if there's a school that's considering it like Westville Great and question. to be able to send the administrator into one of your programs so that they could see it firsthand, does has that happened? Um I yeah, I have had guests come um to, to watch it. I, I do know that we got the approval from the superintendent for Westville that they they do want us to come in it's just scheduling it with them okay. but yeah whether it's parents other teachers or administrators i mean if one school will allow a visitor to come in that's the best way to see it that's mm -hmm. the best way and then they can ask questions directly i think a lot of times people get it when i explain it but they really get it when they watch it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and i, I just do have videos i i am willing i had to make some pre-recorded videos that i'm not super happy about but if you ever had a school inquire about it I can send the videos and then they can get a glimpse into what we're doing okay okay all right any other questions before we let these two ladies go for the night oh um, okay we've got two more so we have we'll go yep. to Pam and then Mac yep Pam oh good um my question is for Mac and that is his last name for my minutes I got David Mac, <laughs> and then I couldn't get the last name. It's Mac Gallier, capital M, little c, capital G, A, L, L, I, A, R, D, Scottish. Ah, awesome. McGalliard. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, then Mac, and then Mac, you had a question. Uh, very quickly, uh, a lot of kids seem to wind up going right back to the home where the abuse took place or whatever the situation is. I know there's not an easy answer to that, but it seems to me like there's got to be a way to I don't, monitor or, I mean, especially in a digital world, there, some sort of check-in system. It was frustrating to turn a kid into the uh, child protection and then wind up with them back in there three days. Right, Mac, and that's exactly what I talked about with um, the, I, I remember that frustration as a school counselor, you'd refer and then all of a sudden you knew they were back in and what's the deal and are they not getting help? And that's when, unfortunately, the school people have to keep calling DCS and saying, I'm still seeing X, Y, Z, what, mm -hmm. you know, is going on. You, you have to keep reporting and Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And the reality is, depending upon the Department of Child Services staff member, um, sometimes things fall through the cracks. And when their caseload is so big, you know, as Sarah said, unless you see uh, that there is a problem, you know, physical abuse, uh, it's very hard to prove. Um, but that is not to say that there are not other ways to get help. If you have trusted people in the school and tell a counselor to say, this is a problem, you know, and get some of the trusted, every school has trusted teachers on board and observing things so that they can try to support this child. And, you know, funny enough, there's other ways aside from Department of Child Services, for instance, getting them you know, a part-time job or get on some, some organization at the school where they don't go home after school. You know, so you can think creatively on how to get this child support. You know, get involved in their church group. You know, I mean, there's just lots of things you can do. So we have to think out of the box. And it is really <laughs> frustrating. I mean, it doesn't always go how we think it, it should go. Um, and that's, that's just, like you said, there's no easy answer to it because we're not the ones in charge and making the decisions in that process. And I will say when they come through our advocacy center, it is a very lengthy process. It's a very thorough, long investigation. There's a lot of people involved in it. And sometimes it still just doesn't go how you think it should, but what you can do and what I always tell any adults that I'm talking to or working with or presenting to is if you keep saying something, if you still feel like it's going on, you keep reporting and the hotline keeps track of that. Even if you call something in 
and they don't send it down for an investigation, there's still record of it. So if another person makes a report on that same child for similar reasons or different reasons or the exact same reasons, it's, it's going to be on file. And you just have to hope that eventually, you know, you know, you're doing the right thing and other people are doing the right thing and that child's going to get the help that they need. But I mean, it is, it's really disheartening when you think other steps should have been taken and they're not. Well, and I can't help but consider how then the child feels mm -hmm. if they come forward with needing help and then it's not substantiated by whatever the state or, you know, that agency decides, yep. uh, you know, is abuse or whatever, or they're not ready to decide that it is. And they came forward and they, and that was a huge step for them. Mm -hmm. And then to right. realize that, you know, there wasn't any immediate help or you yeah, know immediate yeah. answers and so if we can we can keep moving forward and we can keep pushing for them then they know that they can keep doing it as well and that they yeah, can keep yeah. saying you know I need help and I know you're helping me and it hasn't worked yet but I'm going to I'm going to keep saying it I'm not in a safe place right Emily because yeah. it always is messy right Sarah it's always messy I mean it, it's always a messy situation I mean, think of the adults with the whole last few years and Hollywood and all that coming out in, in the Hollywood world and grown people not wanting to come forward. But that's why what Sarah does is so great because it plants the seed early. Hmm, maybe I should say something about this. Or this isn't normal just because it happens in my family. Yeah, but I think that's a big one with the little ones. And that's why we're doing it at kindergarten all the way until they graduate is because a lot of times little kids don't even realize that's not supposed to happen to them. Right. And so right. that's why it is so important. I know a lot of times kindergarten parents are like, you can't, I don't want my kids thinking about that. Well, I, a little kindergartner doesn't want that happening to them. And so mm -hmm. that's why we're talking about it. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much. Seriously, this has been such a wonderful conversation. And like I said, I'd like the fact that we were able to really devote the time to it and really get to understand the, the full programming. So unless there's any other questions, seriously, Jean Ann and Sarah, you both did fantastic. Sarah, you're fine talking in front of adults. So, <laughs> <laughs> but again, thank you so much. I know it's been a long evening, but um, I, I can tell you from this conversation, we're going to be doing more with you guys. I think Wonderful. this has opened up some other potential avenues. And so we will definitely be reaching out and we're going to do whatever we can to continue to get the, the word out in terms of what we've been learning. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I really have enjoyed this evening and being able to talk to you guys and share share this passion with all of you guys as well. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you guys. You. Thank, now. You. Bye. thank <laughs> you. Have a good evening, you guys. Thank Take care. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Are we leaving? Or are we we're, staying here? No, oh, we are. We're all leaving. We can all oh, okay. enjoy <laughs> the rest of our evening. Bye, guys. <laughs>